Hey guys, starting next week I'm adding a new element to all the movies called All the Movies 82 Rewind. In addition to my reviews of new films, I'll be doing a review every week of a film from years past. I let my Twitter followers choose a year for me, and the winner is 1982, considered to be the single best film year for geeks like us. Here's the thing though. I'm only going to be looking at films from 1982 that I haven't seen as a way of filling in some of my cinephile blind spots and discover a bunch of forgotten gems and turds from 25 years ago. As such, I won't be covering Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, E.T. The Extraterrestrial, Tootsie, Gandhi, Rocky III, Porky's, Poltergeist, Annie, Blade Runner, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, The Road Warrior, Pink Floyd, The Wall, Creep Show, The Thing, Tron, Conan the Barbarian, or The Dark Crystal. What will I be covering instead this year? Only time will tell. say I'm a pretty big Les Mis fan. My mom introduced me to the Broadway show when I was pretty young. I got very intimately familiar with the 10th anniversary concert, to the point that hearing any version of Castle on the Clouds without a balloon popping and causing the singer to jump sounds weird to me, even when my sister sang it in her elementary school choir. I actually sang Do You Hear the People Sing at a talent show. So you could say I was looking forward to this new film version. And frankly, I don't know how to feel about it. There is a lot of great stuff here, and when I focus on that, my thoughts toward the film begin to swell, and I start to think I can easily forgive it for its shortcomings, and when I focus on the very, very, very large shortcomings, then those great things become smaller and buried. I've been teeter-tottering on this film for days now. I guess it breaks down to the performances were mostly amazing, the directing was mostly shit. I want to end on a positive note, so let's talk about Tom Hooper, who you probably know as the director of The King's Speech, a decent, if utterly predictable, bit of British Heritage theme park. As something originating from Broadway, there really wasn't much for Tom Hooper to do but point and shoot. The power of this kind of thing lies almost entirely in the performances. But it's almost as if Tom Hooper went, No, I don't want them to just notice the actors, I want them to notice me! Virtually every shot, every cut, every move of the camera draws your attention to itself. It makes you wonder why it had to be this way. Why did everything have to be shot in awkward Dutch angles as if in tribute to Battlefield Earth? Why the rapid cutting? Why no shots that last longer than a second and a half and keeps you disoriented? Why is there no proper establishing shots? Why do the environments in this sweeping historical epic feel so small and soundstagey, and with the occasional bit of unwelcome Tim Burton-esque dark whimsy? Why are the actors staged to be so stiff, to have so little movement in their performances? And why, oh god why, is everything shot on handheld? Why is there a goddamn shaky cam in my Les Miserables? The best parts of the film are the various solos. Songs like I Dreamed a Dream, What Have I Done, On My Own, and Empty Chairs and Empty Tables, because by the very nature of the songs, Hooper is forced to put his camera on a goddamn tripod and let the actors take over. But even then, he resorts to some awkward look at me cutting at moments of character movement. You know the music video for Sunglasses at Night, where the camera and Corey Hart never seem to be in complete sync with each other? It's like that for some reason. I feel like all of these things may be more obvious to a cinephile like myself, but all the same, it screams, look at what I can do with the maturity of a child director. Tom Hooper won a directing Oscar? Are you kidding me? About the only good artistic decision made here was to have the actors sing live, which is rather fresh and inventive for musicals, if not a bit gimmicky. It's pretty much the film's main selling point. I saw more of those behind-the-scenes trailers than I did legit scenes from the film trailers. The music backing the vocals is pretty much the lifted, orchestrated pieces from the Broadway show. Actually, being a super hardcore Les Mis fan might be a detriment when it comes to assessing the music, as it just makes the cuts to the score all the more pronounced. A lot of songs are shortened, few shuffled around, and I believe one of them was cut altogether, and they even added a song that... Well, I understand its inclusion, but it was entirely forgettable. 
I know why these changes were made, I'm just saying it might be distracting if you really like the original score. Which leads us to the performances, and... Okay, Russell Crowe's Javert. He's not a complete embarrassment, but I think the role was taken in the wrong direction. The stage version traditionally paints Javert with righteous fury, a man who believes in his convictions so totally and ain't afraid who knows it. If the Muppets did a version of this, he would be played by Sam the Eagle. That makes the character's solo number stars so poignant as it paints his own character arc, from shining brightly to crashing in flames. But in this version, Javert is not righteous fury, but quiet conviction with Crow maintaining a stony demeanor that would make Buster Keaton nod in approval. I'm not against alternate character interpretations, in fact there's a few others in this film I liked, but it kinda sucks when the lyrics of Javert's two big numbers are completely contrary to his being. And frankly, Crow isn't an amazing singer. Not ear-bleeding bad, but the man doesn't appear to have any range at all. But, outside of that one weak link, everyone else is perfect. Hugh Jackman plays Jean Valjean with a much more subtle edge than is typically allowed on stage, and he seems to be the one taking most advantage of recording the lyrics live on set. He gives the character such emotional range, not afraid to let a note quiver if the moment calls for it. Of course, everyone's talking about Anne Hathaway as Fontaine, and with good reason. While the role of Fontaine was never much more than a glorified cameo, it's such an emotional punch to the gut, and Hathaway throws herself entirely into it. It's sad on steroids. I actually participated in a Cast a Les Mis thread in a forum a few years ago, and I swear to God I put Sasha Barrett Cohen and Helena Bonham Carter in as the innkeepers. They do a fine job in the role, though it seems their scenes suffer the most from Hooper's directing, their pickpocketing antics hidden under constant cutting and shaky cam. Samantha Barks plays Eponine, which she also played on stage, and well, do I really have to keep saying everyone else was good? Amanda Seafried, Eddie Redmayne, Aaron Trevizet, and even Colm Wilkinson, the original stage Jean Valjean. He comes in as the bishop, and I actually like the character's return in the end. It's a change to the stage show that I think actually makes a lot of sense. Again, I find myself flip-flopping all over the place as to how I feel about this film, and I just don't think I can settle on any kind of grade. I'm certainly open to discussion and debating and about its failings and merits. Really, you don't need me to tell you if you're going to see this or not. You know what you like, and I hope this film gives it to you, whatever it may be. There's a lot of things I don't really bother expressing my opinions on, knowing full well that they're polarizing and could start epic flame wars. The issue of American slavery is one of them. Oh, not that slavery wasn't bad, that's a no-brainer. But I kind of have issues in our current public perception towards historical slavery and how it's featured in our media, how it's used almost solely as a bit of emotional shorthand and is not allowed to expand into other kinds of stories. But damn, Quentin Tarantino ain't afraid to toss around some taboos and turn the South into his own personal playground, and bravo for him. Django Unchained is pretty much what you've come to expect from a Tarantino film, with highly expressive and dynamic cinematography and editing, a fun and anachronistic soundtrack, longer scenes of witty dialogue around a table, cartoon levels of blood and gore, old character actors from films Tarantino loves cameoing in smaller roles, and dramatic tonal shifts between real serious drama and sillier excesses. Obviously, your opinion of Tarantino as a whole will match your opinion of Django Unchained. Which means, Mom, if you're watching this, you're not gonna like this movie. But despite all the classic Tarantino tropes present, Django Unchained is probably his most affecting and interesting film to date. And not just because slavery was a bad thing, but because Tarantino doesn't just settle on the easy, knee-jerk emotional slavery narrative. He's just as interested in the rest of the emotional spectrum involved, the first and forefront being the need for revenge and the sense of justice in a very unjust time. The film is full of moments of cathartic release, despite the fact that some of these actions are very detrimental to our heroes, made for many moments where large chunks of the audience cheered and applauded. Also included in the emotional range is humor, and Django Unchained has moments of true hilarity, stemming both from our heroes trying to find a way to smile in these harsh times, and from the genuine fun to be had in the realm of the wicked. And then there's love. Django Unchained is as much a love odyssey as anything else. 
Jamie Foxx's titular Django, a free slave who becomes the partner of Christoph Waltz's Dr. Schultz, a dentist turned bounty hunter, is in search of his wife Brumhilda, played by Kerry Washington, and Django is constantly haunted with images of her throughout his journey. A specter of love that is very simple but also very effective in execution. When he actually finds her, it's a wonderful moment of emotional climax, only to be turned to the side and made a humorous scene. It's kind of the emotional sleight of hand you only find in the movies. So basically, Tarantino is perhaps the first filmmaker that has made the most emotionally varied and complex film on the subject of slavery. Bold claim, certainly, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's something I've missed, or a film you think that pulls it off better, but as of right now, Tarantino has really accomplished something here. The acting is pretty wonderful all around. Jamie Foxx puts in his most complex and intense performance in years. A steely-eyed man who first appears to be too quiet and has no agency on what's going on around him, but we quickly discover that behind all of that is a stern survivalist that lets loose once the white man ain't looking. Christoph Waltz is just as fun playing a good guy here as he was playing a bad guy back in Inglorious Bastards, and Dr. Schultz is one of those enigmatic but also charismatic movie figures that's going to last for a goddamn long time. Leonardo DiCaprio is great as the slimy plantation owner Calvin Candy, who is both genuinely terrifying and kind of pathetic, and probably one of the most evil movie bad guys of 2012. And when you learn some of the behind-the-scenes stuff about his big monologue near the end of the film, you have to wonder what dope red-letter media was smoking when they said DiCaprio wasn't a good actor in their review of Titanic. But the biggest surprise for me was Samuel L. Jackson's Stephen, Candy's butler-esque servant, house negro, and a strange affecting secondary villain. A truly manipulative character and a reminder that Jackson is actually a pretty good actor. This is the biggest physical transformation I've seen from him, and one of his most interesting and complex performances to date. When Inglorious Bastards came out, it became my favorite Quentin Tarantino film. When Django Unchained came out, it became my favorite Quentin Tarantino film. And this is a guy who's been making good films since the beginning of his career. There's not a lot of directors you can say that of, directors who started out really good and only got astronomically better with each production. Tarantino is for real, guys. Well, somebody clearly has an axe to grind against modern parenting. On top of being incredibly unfunny, horribly acted, and plotted like a made-for-TV movie, Parental Guidance seems to be mostly interested in establishing bullshit strawmen in an argument of old-school ways of raising children versus new-school ways. This film is right in that the methods presented are bullshit, but that's only because the methods presented are complete fictions, and there's something contemptible about that. The story is that of Artie and Diane, played by Billy Crystal and Bette Midler, who find themselves taking care of their grandchildren for a week and running into troubles when dealing with all these new parenting methods. The first sign that the filmmakers are talking out of their ass is that one of the things Artie and Diane have trouble over is a completely computerized house. Which is not a parody of home security systems or anything in the actual real world, it's a complete fabrication, invented by the dad character to antagonize these poor old people. Pretty much everything else, from the extracurricular activities of the children to the type of language used around the house, is the same kind of phoniness. It's a complete fairy tale of a modern commentary. Outside of its clownish attempts at saying anything about generational gaps in parenting, the whole production feels like something you see on the Disney Channel. From its safe and completely ballish humor to its good old heteronormative American values and its cast of old actors on career autopilot and some in vain attempts to establish the next big child star. This is the first film I've covered for this series where the acting is all around terrible. The only one who seems to be putting in half an effort is Billy Crystal, and he seems so tired and only really in it for the paycheck. I have no fucking idea what Bette Midler and Marisa Tomei are doing. Their performances are so over the top, not a single drop of subtlety. The child actors are just being child actors, aka sucking. But the biggest offender here is Tom Everett Scott, who comes off so weird and stilted in front of the camera, what appears to be a weird combination of intentional hamminess and total amateur. About the only casting I enjoyed was Gid Watanabe. That was only because I'm a huge fan of UHS and I haven't seen him in a movie in forever, even if he's just playing an ethnic clown. The film also falls into the trouble I had with This Is 40, namely stupid rich people I couldn't possibly care about. Hell, these kind of people are the only ones who might actually raise their children with anything resembling the methods shown here. 
not the middle-class folks who are watching the film. That's almost impressive, constructing this fiction that only applies to certain economic circles. It's both a lie and not applicable to me. This movie is a waste of time. About the only good thing about it is that we no longer have to sit through those Billy Crystal needs to turn off his cell phone ads I've been playing in front of the movies for the past two months. Thank God for little favors, I guess. See you next week. Thank you.